Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining this week's Next Normal series from Worth Live on how technology is helping future-proof the publishing and media industries. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during what has and continues to be a challenging time for so many people. I'm Juliette Scott Croxford, CEO at Worth Media and your moderator for today. And I'm delighted to be joined by our special guest, Benita Stewart, VP, Global Partnerships at Google, Mickey Tolliver King, CMO of the Washington Post, and Kathleen Entwistle, Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management. Hi, everyone. Hey, Hello. Julia. Uh, so as many of you know by now, our intention at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform our community, many of whom are investors, founders and business leaders who want to leave a positive impact on the world and help to create a more inclusive and equal economy and society for the benefit of everyone. And we call that Worth Beyond Wealth. Uh, so we hope you find this session enjoyable and valuable. Forward thinking is really the essence of this series, The Next Normal, where we're looking ahead to what the world looks like in this new environment that we're now all living in. And like so many industries, technology is changing the way that media and publishing industries operate. And it has done really for, for, for more than a decade now. Like, and in a world where news is breaking fast, consumer trust is wavering, consumer habits are continually evolving and diversity and inclusion is more important than ever. Technology is making it easier for media to adapt to an ever-changing world. So we're delighted to have experts with us, Benita Stewart, Mickey Tolliver King and Cathy Emerson to share their perspectives on how technology is future-proofing the media and publishing space. So a few housekeeping rules just before we get started. Uh, I think everyone's very familiar with this format by now. It, it is a conversation and we do welcome questions from you. Um, attendees are muted on entry into this session. However, if you use the chat function at the bottom of the screen, um, feel free to type in questions and comments there. Uh, and I can see that and either unmute you or we'll weave it into the conversation as we go. So let's get started. How technology is helping future-proof the publishing and media industries. Firstly, a check-in with all of you. How are you doing personally? And before we get going, I'd love to hear just briefly from you all about your background. I know, I know there's like a wealth of experience there, but how you became involved in the, in the publishing and media space. Benita, let's start with you. Sure, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be on Worth Media for the first time. Uh, and uh, just to see your uh, industry, uh, your media company evolve. Uh, I, I would say uh, what I'm focused on in terms of personally right now is you call it the next normal. I'm really focused. I think we've all settled in. So I'm focused on the next and we'll talk more about that um, later. But to give you an idea of how I came into the publishing industry, I have to go way back. Uh, and I was a journalism major, even though I decided minored in business, and I decided to really go with more of that business uh, side. And then I was an advertising manager for the Howard University Hilltop. And then when I went on to Harvard Business School, I became the ad manager um, for the Harvest. Uh, so very early on, I was running an ad business. Uh, so that's how I got started, and I've ha always had a passion um, and respect. Um, for the publishing industry. And the ad business has changed quite significantly, I think, since, since, you, do, since you joined. Yes, I, you don't have to run around anymore. You know, it's, it's, we have programmatic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Benita. And, and Mickey, hi, how are you? And, and hi, just Julia. share a bit about your background. Sure. Well, I'm also excited to be with Worth Media today and uh, this great forum of, of, of wonderful panelists. Um, I'm, uh, we have adjusted and sort of settled in here in uh, the Washington, D.C. area and uh, at the Post. We are also very forward thinking about what is next for our subscri subscribers. We are in a, a really unique time of uh, managing, you know, major uh, events with respect to a pandemic and an election 
election and civil unrest and um, the economic challenges that we're facing. And the combination of all of those really does put us in a unique position uh, to serve what we think is an incredible need for our readers and audience. And so we are looking to what does that look like across the course of the next uh, 70 odd days and then beyond into, into uh, 2021. So, so we're also uh, very forward thinking in that regard. Um, I have spent the better part of the last decade in um, the media space. Uh, I've, I've spent most of my career in sales and marketing roles, uh, initially with a company out of uh, DC, the advisory board company that many of you may know, um, and eventually uh, made my way into um, actually doing marketing for a, a, a law firm practice group. And then from there, all, all things in DC lead through uh, a legal profession or a legal education at some point. <laughs> um, and so I, I ended up from there uh, at, at Politico, where I launched Politico's first subscription product and, and moved on to the Washington Post, uh, where I now oversee our entire consumer business, all digital marketing, uh, digital and print slash home delivery, marketing, branding, our licensing and syndication business all falls within my portfolio. Amazing. Thanks, Vicky. And, and, and I, I guess sort of a bit like advertising, the, the, the discipline of marketing has been impacted so much by technology as well from uh, I guess the sort of traditional sense of brand marketing to performance marketing and, and acquisition and subscriptions absolutely uh, yeah we'll, we'll get we'll get into that in, in a bit more detail later on Kathy I, I just want to welcome you as well Thank and welcome you. back um, I, I'd love you just to share a bit about what you do and also um, you, you do work with a lot of entrepreneurs and and um, clients in the media and entertainment space so sort of coming at it from a different angle though absolutely and that's exactly so i'm a managing director private wealth advisor at morgan stanley i made a shift from another firm just a few months ago and so i've had lots of transitions too and we talk about digital transformation i had a physical transformation and trying to you know make sure that we're connecting with our clients and keeping them abreast of everything going on technology has been extremely useful in this time period i think we've all found it to be super helpful um, so our clients are typically either you know we help startups but a lot of our clients have been established they've you know gotten to a point where they realize they've got a lot of um, net worth or um, resources and they're not quite sure what to do with it. So we come in and help them with a full wealth management picture and look at all areas of their financial life, including lending and financial planning and estate planning and wealth transfer and all sorts of things. And we, we bring all the resources we have to them in order to give them the, the best overall experience. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and before we get into sort of the industry as a whole, because obviously the industry has been impacted over the last five or six months um, quite significantly by both the pandemic, the racial justice movement, and obviously we've got the upcoming election as well. Um, but really the, 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 the media and publishing industry has been, has been in a sort of transformative state since sort of the early 2000s, I would say. Um, Benita, sort of in in the last sort of 10 15 years just talk us through sort of the macro picture of the, the the impact on the media and entertainment space and the publishing space but but i guess specifically how has it shifted in the last sort of five to six months with with covid19 yeah so it's it's been quite a shift um and in in some cases, you know, leading up to the pandemic, and we've obviously had social unrest uh, as well. Um, but with the pandemic, one of the things that we've seen uh, with some of the, the, the turbulence that's happening within the industry, some of our publishers, quite frankly, are not faring as well. Uh, so if you look at our local publishers in the U.S., there's close to 1,300 local newspapers and i think wherever we are sheltering we are probably so dependent on that local news and so one of the things that we did at google was to move swiftly we wanted to make sure you know who was most in need uh, in terms of responding to the industry uh, and so while the industry has evolved over a period of time we came forth with a journalism uh, relief fund so we provided uh, close to $40 million 
of relief uh, to 5,600 uh, local and medium-sized newsrooms. And that was across 115 countries because we do realize it is global uh, in nature. And we, we realize many of the, within the industry, while we're all in the same boat, we are, we're in different boats. And so as we start to look at the industry, we know, and I look at Mickey, and there are those that are quite frankly, that have made pivots and they're investing, but then there are those in the industry that are challenged and, or they're just trying to adjust uh, to the new environment. And so one of the things that we do is to try to make sure that we are segmenting our partners to make sure that we can provide the level of need uh, that is required. And have any opportunities arisen uh, for publishers out of, um, out of the pandemic, do you think? I mean, uh, obviously that it's a challenged industry in many senses in that, um, the sort of advertising space is, is, is dominated by a big few. Um, and obviously we've had to, a lot of publishers have had to diversify their revenue streams. Have you seen, what opportunities have you seen that have arisen out of it? I think there's two. One uh, is the fact that there's industry convergence. Uh, and as part of leading the global partnerships, I cover all of the industries. So you start to see how the industries are converging in many ways. Uh, so you have large retailers right now that didn't anticipate all of the user growth that would come to their sites. And so they are in fact becoming publishers and thinking about how they're using uh, advertising uh, technology. Um, and then there are others that uh, are looking at this in terms of more preparation meeting opportunity where they have are thinking about where they have prepared. They're looking at their site uh, in terms of site optimization. Uh, we had one particular partner, for example, with uh, AccuWeather that looked at their site and looked at how it was loading and they were able to come in and activate very quickly uh, to have a 42% you know, increase in their over, uh, overall CPM. So we're seeing many that are navigating uh, two areas and industries borrowing uh, from other industries. That's great. And, and Mickey, how has um, how has the last few months impacted the Washington Post? Well, one of the major things we had to grapple with very early on was the balance between serving the public need for information and being able to get information, accurate information out quickly, um, balancing that with our business model, which is one that is highly reliant on reader revenue. So that was one that we really did grapple with and spent a lot of uh, late nights really talking through and trying to figure out how best to handle. And I think I think that we did find the right way to balance that in the sense that we made a certain body of our coverage free to the public, and it continues to be free to the public, which is um, uh, quite a bit of information that is uh, coming out of the CDC, um, anything related to uh, sort of the day-to-day -day impact of COVID-19 on communities uh, versus um, other coverage that we that remained behind our, our, our paywall. So we really had to grapple with that. We really had to uh, work closely with our newsroom and our, our, our um, advertising partners, my team, to understand how best to serve both the public need as well as obviously the business um, in, in managing that. So I think that we did, I do think that we, we achieved that in, in most ways. It continues to be an issue uh, because uh, we this is not ending today or tomorrow, as we know. So we need to continue to understand how to best. Uh, and I think this is true for publishing generally, because as we see uh, the shift to more toward re reader revenue, um, this will be particularly of concern to local publishers, understanding how to balance um, serving the community, serving the, the audience need for information, and, and then uh, obviously uh, be being a sustainable business model uh, by continuing to grow reader revenue and have you have you seen an increase in subscriptions over the last 
six months? We have. Uh, we've seen a substantial increase across the course of, of the last six months. We've grown uh, nearly 35% year to date um, from, from where we were in 2019. And uh, it really, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to see that um, even in a moment like this, even in a moment where we're making quite a bit of, uh, of our coverage available free to the public, um, there is still a clear, I, I think a growing understanding among our, our readers, upon, uh, among the audiences generally, that quality journalism is a service worth paying for. And so I think that that becomes even, even more obvious as we get further and further into this, as we start to understand what the new normal looks like. Uh, there are so many implications for this for communities all across the country. And I think that um, there is a real need uh, from our readers and our audience to understand to understand this at a really uh, deep level. And, and I, I do believe that our readers understand now that there is a difference between just a lot of the noise uh, that they have access to versus the well-reported investigative news that, that, uh, that certain publishers are providing. Thank you, it's Kathy. I have a quick yeah, question, on. sorry, Juliet. Um, in terms of the readership and uh, you know sort of revenues, mm -hmm. are you finding that partnering with you know corporate America? Are you finding partnerships where they're willing to sponsor? Oh, there it goes. Sponsor you know information to others happening, or more partnerships happening where people are stepping up to support the good news that you're bringing to the table. We are actively pursuing that, Kathy. That's such a great question because I think that, you know, you, you, if you think about communities across uh, the U.S. right now, uh, everything from the teacher community to first responders to uh, the uh, various classes at HBCUs, we're exploring a number of different options for partnering with corporations to, to underwrite uh, subscriptions. So uh, we don't have one to announce just yet, but uh, stay tuned. And you're, but you're all in positions of leadership. So I'd love just to spend a few minutes on that, that moment, um, I guess, sort of February, March, when we sort of all, all saw this coming. Um, but we, I don't think any of us sort of could quite predict the extent to um, the shift that we were about to see. Um, and we went into lockdown. Um, what, how did you sort of respond as leaders? And I know, Benita, you talk about putting the oxygen mask on first. Um, how, just talk us through that and, and before kind of responding both to your business and then also obviously to your partners, what, what were the sort of steps that you took? Well, absolutely correct. I think as a leader, you do need to put on your oxygen mask and it, it's, it's a phrase that's used all the time, but this time we had to do it. And it was very important uh, at the time. And then we immediately uh, shifted to our partners uh, because we're a technology company. We were very comfortable with technology, but given the extraordinary times, it was what did we need to do for our partners and what sort of best practices did we need to, to bring in? And so we were essentially all in looking at how we can take our consultations, moving them into a virtual uh, situation, thinking about our product uh, portfolio. So what were some of the new products that we could bring into the fold? Uh, so whether it was subscribe with Google to make sure that we were supporting uh, subscriptions, it was also making sure that uh, our audio product we've now uh, launched. And I think what's interesting about a crisis, you, you figure out how agile, you really are, uh, you know, as an organization, as a team, uh, as a, you know, working with your partners in terms of making decisions. And so there was speed that was coming from an acceleration. And I will cite this stat because it, it really gives an, an idea of the acceleration that occurred. But McKinsey mentioned that the per, uh, percent penetration of e-commerce grew 10 years in three months. And so if you start to think about that in every, whether it's on the news publishing side, restaurants, everyone went into the e-commerce business all at once. And so that a pivotal point from a digital transformation uh, perspective, it was very important during this, um, in the midst of these times is to make sure that we could bring the right portfolio of products 
uh, to the situation at hand. Bonita, uh, that's so interesting. I'm sorry, again, I just want a quick question. First of all, I, the statistic that you just shared is mind blowing, right? Uh, 10 years and three months. I mean, we've been talking about digital transformation has been accelerated by the onset of COVID, but to, to put it in those terms really brings it to light. I was gonna ask you two questions. One is, what, um, what are you most proud about, um, either you or your company, in the, in the beginning of COVID, in like the midst of it, sort of as a follow on to Juliet's question. And then second, what are some of the new innovations that you guys have come out with that you can share, um, you know, just a, maybe an overview, just so we have an idea of what's, what's happening over by you guys? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and that's a good question. I, I, I would say what I'm most proud of um, is that we were not frozen. We brought speed to the equation. And so that I was proud of that, um, how we came together as a team, how we were thinking about our partners and the industry. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, and, and there was creativity. So someone on my team said, we might have some of our publishers that have products that look like games. So why don't we actually take our non-gaming publishers and introduce them to the best practices? So you think of a crossword puzzle, that's a game. And so how could they actually think about revenue diversification in new ways? So I think one was speed uh, to the market uh, and to our partners. I think the other was more around uh, the insights that we could bring. And so through the Google News Initiative, uh, we launched uh, the, the News Consumer Insights. And so this is a free tool, I will say that again, free tool for publishers that is an overlay with Google Analytics. And so that would allow them, and Mickey has talked about reader revenue, but you need to know, understand what the reader is doing. Absolutely. And so by bringing that uh, to the equation with our consumer insights, and then we had a fast follow uh, within the past year where we now have real time consumer insights. So imagine how valuable that is right now to understand with this plethora of news uh, that we have to understand that. And uh, so I do think that's important. And I will also say, because I, when the first time I walked into the Washington Post, I have such admiration because when I went into the building, the first thing that I saw was a digital billboard. <laughs> and then going up into the newsroom, they have actually reimagined uh, the newsroom. And so I do think that that's something in terms of understanding the, the insights from your consumers. Yes. They know exactly in that newsroom, everyone's there. It's completely integrated with the podcast, video, and also understanding which stories are trending. Um, and so I, I would say surprise, you know, what was most important was the speed. I think the, the second category was really understanding the consumer. And that's where we spent a lot of our time. That real time content insights product is fantastic. And, and it just sort of coming from one, a smaller publisher, we, we're using it. Um, and um, it's, it's so uh, insightful, but very simple as well. I think that's what I like about it. it. You don't have to kind of delve in too much and it just kind of visually gives you a picture of, you know, how many casual readers do you have versus loyal readers and how many people are, recirculating content and um yeah so so I, it's certainly been incredibly helpful to us to understand what content is engaging the community and 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 what's not and mickey and having that level of detail on the the data related to our audience has been immensely helpful the, one of the major innovations that we made this year was really the full adoption of google analytics i mean that has been transformative for the washington post because um while we have um for some time been 
I would say, data focused and a team um, that was dedicated to that. The level of insight that we have been able to gain through having this, the interface that we have through Google Analytics has just been incredibly eye-opening. And it has also led us to a number of other studies that we have been able to do even qualitatively about our subscribers and our readers. But um, Benita is exactly right. Our newsroom, although we're not sitting in it right this moment, <laughs> um, our, our, we, we have really um, made an organizational shift toward uh, being focused on uh, our, our consumer and audience data. And I think that when, when we, every decision that we have made, related to how we are delivering the news to subscribers and to our users ultimately is based on um, answering certain questions about um, that that our data just gives us insights about. Um, and that is everything from content to the placement of content on our site to uh, pricing. It, it really is a, a very integrated process that we go through, which is, you know, incorporating data uh, into all of our, our all of our decision making, and it really has been transformative for for the Washington Post. And Mickey, have you found that um, through some of those changes, and also through um, the the events of the past six months, have you been reaching new audiences uh, that you hadn't previously reached, or or is it kind of um, the, the same audience, but they are even more engaged? I think it's been both. It's been, when, when we think about uh, readers of the Washington Post, they are the uh, uh, perpetually intellectually curious. Uh, they are uh, generally those who have, um, who spend a lot of their time consuming news. And so um, certainly if you look at Comscore numbers, if you look at everything else, our audience has grown. Do I think um, the audience has, has I, I would say that I think that we've broadened the number of people who, who we're bringing to our site. And then our subscriber um, page views ha and, and engagement with, with us have increased substantially as well. So I would say the answer to your question is yes, both. Um, we're, we've been able to see audience growth as well as we probably saw uh, roughly um, 10 to 15 percent audience growth across the course of uh, the height of, of the pandemic in the early months when all of us were just hungry for information um, and that has leveled out somewhat in terms of the growth of the audience but what we continue to see is deeper engagement among our subscribers and readers. Um, I, I've noticed a few additional people joined so I just wanted to welcome everyone to this conversation around how tech is future-proofing the publishing and, and media industries and I know we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, before I go to those I just wanted to spend a bit of time on the sort of diversity and inclusion space. Um, and with, with so many people still working from home, how are you, how are you motivating your teams and bringing them together to kind of stimulate, simulate the office? Um, Benita and Mickey, I'm interested in sort of the, the, the approaches that you've been taking to that. Benita first. Yeah, well, I would say for our team, we early on, and, and it, many of the ideas come from my team. And so it was, how do we simulate the office environment? Um, and so we did that first. Uh, so we created these connections. So we, if we wanted to ride the Peloton together or have a, a coffee hour, or we have someone on our team who does meditations. So we have that during the week and Friday, we have guest speakers. Um, and then all of a sudden we had George Floyd, you know, that eight minutes and 46 seconds that really in the middle of a pandemic kind of turned everything on its side. And so it was, how are we going to care for each other? How are we going to get through this? And then for many, it was eye opening. It was just an awakening around knowledge. And so even as a team, because we had spent so much time in the very beginning, connecting and creating those points while we were working from home for Juneteenth, we spent our time saying we are all going to reflect. And so some people were reading, you know, the 1619 uh, project uh, that was uh, done through the New York Times. We also, people were watching 13th, um, the, uh, Ava DuVernay documentary. Mm -hmm. And then the Harvard Business School has a case study on inequality in the US. And then we had small discussion uh, space. And that was really, quite frankly, creating the psychological safety 
uh, that was required to really move forth as a team. And so I think we had many, many moments to bond, but we created those moments. And then we also opened up the space for areas where that were might, might have been a bit uncomfortable. Uh, and, but we allowed ourselves uh, to live together in those space, even though we were working from home. And, and, and Mickey, what steps did you take both, um, obviously, to, to make sure that the team felt included, but also uh, following, the, following the, the George Floyd murder and, and the subsequent social unrest? We had the advantage of um, a team that worked uh, sporadically remotely even before now so that 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 did help uh, we had a number of folks who were most of our team was set up to work well remotely and was used to calling into a meeting or being a, being there even if they weren't physically there so we were able to continue that every uh, regularly scheduled meeting that we had on the calendar in January continues up until now so that that has been uh, that was an, an advantage that we've that we established early on that served us well here. Um, following the George Floyd uh, murder, we spent a lot of time as an executive team really trying to listen and gather questions and feedback from our staff about one, how were they doing? And two, how were we doing? So. Um, helping people, a lot of those conversations were one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we, we made uh, services in both, uh, obviously, through our talent management and HR team uh, available to everyone. And then as, as those of us managing large organizations and managing departments, reaching out to folks really individually and, and seeing how they were doing, checking in. Um, there were times when we just acknowledged that we needed to give someone the afternoon off or we needed to give them the day off just because the news is a lot to take in in a day and and every now and then you need to be able to close your laptop and and go throw a baseball with your child or whatever it is that allows you to take a brain break so i think that as managers and i've, I've heard this really across the company i think there was just a lot of sensitivity that we try to express to folks individually so that was that's on the on the question of how checking in with how people are doing how are they doing and then we were asking the question of how are we doing we held a, a company-wide town hall shortly after the George Floyd, George Floyd killing, um, to have folks uh, share with us their feelings about um, inclusion and diversity in the workplace. Some of those messages were hard to hear. I think that executives really across the company, uh, across the country, have heard some tough messages from staff. Uh, but I, I really think that we, we had a, an ear to listen and a heart to listen. And we've made what I believe are some incredibly important changes across the course of the last several months. Uh, for one, we committed to um, hiring a director of diversity and inclusion within our newsroom to serve the roles specifically related to content. So ensuring that all of our publishing has the lens of reflecting um, the, the sort of diversity and sensitivity that we need to um, given the audience that we serve and, and, and the landscape of, of our country and of the world. So we hired Krista Thompson into that role a long time Washington Post veteran um, who we are excited to promote into that role uh, and she's reporting uh, directly into Marty Barron our executive editor uh, it's an incredibly important role and one that I, I believe we will have this is not something that we're doing just in the moment we're committed to it um, we're also committing to uh, publishing on a regular basis uh, our numbers around diversity and inclusion you might have seen uh, some numbers that came out publicly today from a, a number of other publishers we are committed to publishing um, our diversity and inclusion uh, uh, data because we believe that will hold us accountable. We don't want to make empty promises to the staff that we don't continue to follow up on. So I believe that you know, putting, um, making that information publicly available to our staff and to the public will help us to remain accountable uh, on, uh, with respect to the commitments that we've made uh, in, in diversity and inclusion. And, and um just a, a build on 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 gender equality uh, Benita I know you and I were talking the other day about it's, it's 2021 the year of the woman um <laughs> and and we now have a a, a female VP um elected so I, I know Benita you've just uh, published a book and you're writing a book just share a bit about the the context of that uh, sure um 
So I've co-authored a book. It's called A Blessing, Women of Color Teaming Up uh, to Lead, Empower, and Thrive. Uh, it's data-driven uh, in the sense that we have surveyed over 4,005 women across all races. That's Black, Latinx, Asian, white, but across all four generations. And that is the difference in terms of the, the generational uh, diversity, which was eye-opening uh, for us. I will say, because uh, sometimes people say, a blessing, what does that mean? And a blessing is a gathering of unicorns. So when you think about women of color, that we're in many respects scattered. And within whether uh, certain teams or certain divisions or certain industries. And so when we found that a gathering of unicorns was a blessing. We said that absolutely should be the name of the book. Um, but we explore a number of topics, um, including uh, just looking at leadership, inclusive leadership, understanding the role of allies, uh, but also understanding what it takes, the grit, the resilience, the family, as well as the, the self-care that's, that's required. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we look at um, um, what it takes to win. And in many respects, uh, if you look at uh, Black women, it's the largest uh, cohort of college educated women. It's the fastest growing. And so when you start to look at um, what's happening around us, it, it's an opportunity for us since we are winning. We're not all the way there in terms of breaking certain barriers, but there is an opportunity and our call to action is really for women of color to team up and we have an opportunity uh, to do that. And when we do that, uh, we'll, we'll go much further. I'm, very, I'm excited to read it. Um, I'm, let's go to some questions now. Uh, then we've got a great question from Justin Douglas, who's based in the UK. Justin, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, Justin. What's your question and who's it for? Well, it's really, it's really to um, both our publishing experts here. Um, I mean, it's something that I think about a lot, especially as, we, uh, as I sort of follow the news internationally. Um, and I think about how technology brings huge benefits when it comes to disseminating news across vast audiences, potentially. But we also know, and you won't be surprised when I say this, that it, is, that it is often the same technology that allows false news to spread fast and for truth to be suppressed, especially in oppressive regimes. I mean, it's a difficult one. How do you feel about it? Do we dare hope for a better situation in the future? Well, perhaps I'll start. Um, and, and I will say with technology, this is a difficult problem. Um, however, we're not afraid of it. Um, we are tackling that uh, in terms of looking at making sure that we are focused on quality journalism and making sure that we're not spreading misinformation. Uh, so many of what you're seeing right now in terms of how we're reacting, uh, but we are absolutely focused on this. But sometimes it does become what we call in the U.S. the whack-a-mole, you know, because of the technology that we might have one and we think we've tackled it and we have to go uh, to another. But we will continue to use te technology as well to actually combat the situation. But it, it is a difficult one. Mickey? And I think that for publishers like the Washington Post, and I, I certainly, I believe I speak for others in saying this too, remaining true to our mission of being focused on investigative journalism, being focused on uh, continuing to ask the hard questions and get to the, get to the facts um, has never been more important. And I can tell you that uh, we are doubling down and investing in our newsroom. I know that there are other reputable publishers that are doing the same. And I, I still believe in the, uh, the ability and the and the intellect of our audience to be able to sift through some of that. There is a lot of noise out there, as I was as I was saying earlier. But I think that more and more, um, it's becoming clearer 
what the noise is. I, I, I actually do believe that. I do believe that, you know, even in, in the news that we've heard in the past couple of, of days and, and what, is, what is so clearly dangerous information that's being proliferated, um, I, believe that, I believe that our audiences, I believe that our readers, I believe that our readers, who, some of whom are our greatest ambassadors, uh, are going to help to ensure that it's the truth and it's the facts and it's the, the real investigation that rises to the top. And so um, I think it's going to, I think it's both uh, journalists and uh, 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 publishers being committed to their true north, which is uh, being truth tellers. And then uh, also our audiences and, and responsible readers, people like you, Justin, um, who, help to, um, who help to ensure that it really is, that, it, that the facts are what rise to the top. And, and Mickey, there's a there's a build on this question um, for, for, from someone in the audience that, that's asked how you think the election year has and will continue to affect the growth of media companies. And and, and I think you just shared that your your newsroom is growing. Um, what, what impact do you think the election will have on on, on media and publishing? Well, I think that leading up to an election, uh, our audiences want information. They, they simply want to know uh, what is happening. They want to know where candidates stand. Um, I think that regardless of what any candidate may believe, there is no vote that can be taken for granted. There is no vote that should be assumed. Um, and I think that um, I think that voters, I think that um, all American citizens are going to be looking to uh, looking to publishers, looking to journalism to help inform their decisions. And th there are certain decisions that are that are broadly before us. We obviously know that the presidential election is 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 one that we're that we're focused on. But even down ballot, I think that there is going there is a hunger for information. So if you think about uh, the 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 sort of cyclical nature of, of retail or of other businesses. Uh, certainly journalism has a cyclical, cyclical nature, nature with respect to uh, elections. So is this a time of, of growth for journalism? Absolutely. Do I think that will continue uh, through the end of this year? Absolutely. I think in the early part of 2021, there's going to be whatever administration takes hold um, or continues, there are going to be un the questions that are going to have to be answered about um, how we're dealing with the fallout from this pandemic and the economic um, situation that has come from it. Uh, and so uh, does, uh, does the interest in journalism and news grow during that time? I believe it does. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think there's, there's often, you know, quotes out there that the, the, the publishing industry is dying. But I think there's been a real shift in that there is a public need for information and actually... I think what's shifting is the partnerships that we have with the likes of um, tech providers and platforms um, and, and, and enterprises like Google and, um, you know, people that can support the, the continuation of newsrooms, um, but allow for independent quality journalism at the same time. And I think that's the real shift. It's recognizing, okay, maybe the the traditional model of pure advertising isn't the way forward to sustain your business model, but there is a lot of other innovations that we can, we can use and take and collaborations and partnerships to continue the, the important, the, the importance of, of sharing factual and, and quality information to society. Absolutely. Um, Benita, uh, just thinking about the future, what, what, do, what does the future of publishing and media look like sort of in the next, when, when this is over, or, or I, I don't think this is quite probably the right phrase, but sort of what do you think sort of it looks like next year and five years and 10 years from now? Well, I think that um, first it will be data driven, I, I think, and it will be consumer centric. We hear that. You know, but now you're getting the test in terms of are you actually consumer centric? Do you understand your consumer, your reader uh, in, in this respect? I also think there, there were some that were, um, didn't have a revenue diversification portfolio. So understanding all aspects of potential revenue uh, opportunities. Uh, so whether that is on video whether it is on audio, which we brought into the programmatic fold now, 
uh, as well as subscriptions. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are going into a new era of subscriptions. And I think we're seeing it right now. We're subscribing to everything. And I think this is a, a, a tremendous opportunity. And I, I see that area evolving even more so uh, going forward. Uh, and as audio continues, digital audio continues to take off, even though uh, right now people are not commuting as much, but you think about the importance of audio and what it will be in the future. I think planning now, um, and that's one of the things we encourage our partners to do is, is participate in beta. So to actually anticipate the future uh, so I do think uh, audio will be important. I, and I also believe there is going, in addition to the revenue diversification, there will be more of an integrated platform that is data-driven. So um, the platform of the future will be automated and it will be highly integrated in terms of how all of these work together. Um, and it must be uh, seamless. I am absolutely hopeful um, because the information that comes from our uh, publishers and the quality journalism, the fact that right now, and as Justin mentioned, uh, you know, the information is important and it will always be important. And so uh, that is why we are so focused on the Google News Initiative. That was the major thing that we did uh, in, in 2018 was to make sure that, it, that journalism survives. And so uh, we will certainly add in some financial um, as we have been to make sure that, that we're working with our publishers. But I see a future that is clearly bright um, and it will be integrated, it will be diversified um, and I think there will be some exciting new best practices that are going to cross over from other industries in, into the publishing industry. It's interesting because there's a question around what can other businesses and fields learn from the media industry's adoption of tech and digital. And I was thinking about the finance industry, Kathy, and I know obviously it's highly regulated, but you do, you do see a lot of uh, other industries adopting sort of content platforms and, and data. Um, I'm curious around sort of from, from the finance space, uh, what, what do you see in the digital and media space that you think could be learned? I think, well, first of all, when um, Bonita and Mickey were talking about um, the overlay of, of Google on trying to understand your data, I think that that's probably something that can apply to many different industries. Um, in terms of just simple things. We're seeing, you know, eDocuSign. Um, that was, that, you know, now that's all we're using is eDocuSign. We weren't using it, you know, four or five months ago. And, um, you know, anything that's digital where you're not making payments, um, you're not handing somebody a credit card, you're able to deposit checks. We've encouraged all of our clients to sign up for online services and be able to deposit you know, directly into their account because offices are closed all across the country. I mean, there are some people who are in the offices, but you know, certainly it was a bare minimum in the beginning and it's just slowly starting to, to, you know, creep in. So to be able to have conference calls with clients, Zoom calls, you know, that sort of thing. I know in the beginning when we had um, the first, listen, when it was the, the week of the worth, uh, the Women in Worth Summit, right, where my previous company, we were working with you to support uh, the event. And you and I were on the phone trying to figure out if it could happen or not. And even like two or three days before, and I think, what was it, the 6th of March was the Fifth. event? Yeah, yeah. printed on my two, brain. Two, <laughs> right, two or three days yeah. before we weren't sure. We, we were like, well, why wouldn't we have this? And we, we, got, we, got in, we had it by the skin of our teeth and it was a really wonderful event. But again, it was like trying to figure out what to do next. And, you know, media, you, you know, the delivery of, of magazines and, so, and newspapers are more expensive and harder to get out. And being able to go digital has been quite, you know, successful for us. Hosting, you know, I was hosting client calls with, you know, the markets were collapsing. That's, that's you know, clients, uh, their, their personal financial picture looked dire. We were hosting calls with, you know, our muni bond experts, to, you know, um, with our equity experts, with any, anything that had to do with health and wellness, any sort of 
valid, you know, information that was relevant that we can provide to our clients to give them a sense of comfort because in anything, it's the unknown. It's, we don't know what's around the corner. And this was the first time in a really long time, I think the world um, suffered through a moment of what's coming next, what's around the corner and the unknown. And so now, even though we still might not know what's coming around the corner, I think we feel more prepared and more in control. And by taking that action to create a different way of doing things and doing it maybe better or more with more meaning or with more kindness or whatever that may be, we've been able to do that. So that that's the way. And I see a lot of that in the financial world and other places as well. That's a great answer. Um, I, I, and I have to ask Kathy, it's sl slightly different type because I know you work um, in the sort of sports and entertainment space uh, at Morgan Stanley. You've just constructed an exciting um, initiative with the NFL. Yes, yes, we just, just sent that deal just to, almost two weeks ago, they announced it. So we have, um, yeah, so the head of our sports and entertainment division is a woman by the name of Sandra Richards, and she's phenomenal. So she really did a lot of the work with others. But it's basically people who come into money suddenly and they have their focus on other things and, and even even just people that that come into money um, over time if you're not paying attention to the money piece of it you can get you can make very bad decisions for yourself very quickly so to be able to work with um nfl players uh with the financial planning if you think about it look at what's happened to their season six months ago you would think here's my financial plan this is my this is the money I'll have coming in. This is, you know, what I can expect to do. And then the pandemic hits and then all of a sudden a season is, um, you know, different, looking different than it was. Certain players are deciding not to participate playing this season. What does their financial picture now look like? Because you have to think of all the different variations and how that's affected. So to be able to sit down with um, an advisor from Morgan Stanley and be able to have the resources and tools of a firm like Morgan Stanley to help support that effort, I think is tremendous. Um, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. I will say too, one of the things that I really loved about coming to the firm in the last three months, we talk about diversity, um, we've all been talking for a decade or more that you have to have diverse teams. You have to have your teams and your employees reflect the world around you. And one of my biggest surprises in a very positive way is how diverse Morgan Stanley is. And that really, you know, it was, it's so nice to actually see it working and, and how it works. Um, and just looking at everybody as bringing different strengths um, to the table and being um, respected and appreciated for their abilities and realizing that their backgrounds also bring something valuable to the table. That's, so that's been my big surprise and really excited for that too. Thank you, Kathy. And, and before, before we wrap this up, I, I want to uh, ask a final question um, to all of you. Um, Mickey, what excites you most about the, the, next, the, the next period in this industry? I think we're going to know and understand our consumers even better than we do today. I, I think that we are on a path to uh, developing uh, more closer connections with our our, our, our digital audience um, because of the, the data that, that we've shared. Um, I believe that we're going to get to the right answer in terms of balancing um, privacy with being able to serve the needs of the consumer in a very real way. And I think, you know, people ask me all the time, do I believe that people are, are, are going, that, that, do I believe that subscription fatigue is happening? Um, and I, I say to that, uh, no. Because I believe that what is what is in fact happening is that all of us are determining what is going to be a part of our um, media diet, if you will. And so um, I don't believe that uh, I believe that there's a place for um, 
for sort of share of wallet for the Washington Post and every other publisher who is delivering value to their readers. And so I think that as we learn more and more about what that looks like, where are the platforms uh, that our readers are going and meet them there? Um, how do we give them a world-class experience when they're interacting with us on our own platform? I think the more we learn and the more we gather about the, the areas of content interest and the areas of, of, of platform utilization uh, it's just going to make us smarter and smarter about um, the experience that we're giving to each one of our readers. And I, I believe that we are, we are creating the kind of experience uh, that is going to make uh, journalism indispensable. I couldn't agree more, Mickey. And I, and I think um, I, I agree with you on, on the subscriptions piece. And I almost kind of see um, sort of a, a, a birth of like um, hyper communities and because because we just want launch the women and worth membership as well and i kind of think actually there's a place for a lot of these things and depending yes. on who you are the role you have at work your your preferences your hobbies i think there's a lot there's a space for a lot of these things absolutely um benita what what excites you about the next period in in the industry and, and what are some of the bright spots that you see on the horizon well, I, I do think that um, the publishers are going to go through this period and they are going to come out in a new and different and reimagined way. And I think there will be more of an appetite for experimentation. Uh, I agree with you on the hyper communities. I think there could be a resurgence of local because mm -hmm. as, as all of a sudden, as people are moving into different communities, and we're seeing it from the large cities migrating out, I do think there's going to be this uh, resurgence of, of local in a new and different uh, imagined uh, way. Um, I also believe that the publishers that are putting in the investment into quality journalism will get the ROI. And I think there will be a, more of a thirst for knowledge and truth. And uh, so, that is what excites me, is the fact that um, I think there will be more reimagined uh, publisher business models that are sustainable, um, and the technology will just serve as the, the foundation and the enabler of that success. Thank you, Benita. And Kathy, what are you most looking forward to and, and hopeful for? Well, I think it's interesting what uh, Benita said um, in terms of new and reimagining. I do see that there's a shift and we're seeing a lot of um, back to the basics, um, back to local and also really, truly quality, um, truth, you know, accurate and relevant, I, I would say, are all going to have a, a piece to to to. Um, to contribute to where we need to go. And the, the companies um, like uh, Washington Post, um, they're going to survive and thrive because they are focused on all the right things. Um, and they have incredible people like Mickey behind the scenes doing all the work. Um, so I so can't claim to be to doing you. all the work. <laughs> well, <laughs> doing a lot of it, leading, leading the forces. And, um, and also the fact that the personal responsibility piece, I think that people are recognizing in today's world this year from, from all, you know, COVID, um, uh, the, the murders, like everything that's been going on, we all have a personal responsibility. And I think we're taking that responsibility. And I think corporations are taking the corporate responsibility too and trying to do their part as well to support where we are and what we need to do to get to the next place, the next normal. Thank you. Um, Benita, Mickey and Kathy, thank you so much for such a, a hopeful and interesting and insightful discussion into the Thanks, future. Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really great. And, and, and good luck with all of your exciting initiatives that you've got coming up um, and, and the new product launches and the book launch. Um, and, and a special thank you to you, Kathy, as well, for being, for being our partner for this series. Um, and most importantly, thanks to all of you that joined us today and for your great questions. 
We hope you enjoyed it. Please do share any feedback with us. We'd love to hear your comments. You can email us at community at worth.com and tune in next, next week at Worth Live. Join us on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll be talking about how the workplace is becoming more inclusive with special guest Terry Cooper, Chief Inclusion Officer of Deloitte, Mita Malik, Head of Diversity and Cross-Cultural Marketing at Unilever, and Gina Hadley, co-founder of The Second Shift, and Kathleen Entwistle. You can register online at worth.com forward slash events for that event, as well as sign up for our newsletter if you haven't done, um, and also uh, our Women and Worth Virtual Summit, which is coming up over three days, September 15th to the 17th. In the meantime, be kind, stay healthy, safe, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.